<laughs> Isabel <laughs> Hilton, thank you so much for agreeing to an interview for my book, A Restored Earth. I wanted to talk to you about China because this is a country that you have known for a very long time and clearly it's central to our whole international efforts to put the planet on a more sustainable direction. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you a bit about China Dialogue and the work that you do. China Dialogue is uh, now 10 years old and we, was, we, we set ourselves up uh, as a completely bilingual website to try to have an even-handed uh, conversation with China on matters environmental and climate change on the grounds that you know there's an awful lot of telling China what to do and nobody really likes that and probably not a lot of listening to China and its problems so the even-handedness was important and we translate absolutely everything and we publish in two directions so if you want to know about China and you want to know what Chinese policymakers and activists and environmentalists think directly, you can read it directly on our website rather than filtered through the lens of a Western reporter, many of whom are very good but nevertheless they're doing it from a Western perspective. And if you're a Chinese reader of China Dialogue and you want to understand what's happening in Washington, for instance, on climate change, or experience from elsewhere, things like how did London clean up after the Great Fog, or what happened after the Great Stink in the Thames, how do, you know, how was it done elsewhere, because all of these problems have happened in every industrial revolution, mm -hmm. and, you know, people have had to deal with it. Mm. Um, so a Chinese policymaker can read about that rather than reading about what how Westerners think China's failing. <laughs> what a wonderful thing! We need more <laughs> such dialogue in the world. So, so it was really to say, look, we're just going to facilitate this. I mean, obviously, we stimulate it because we commission and we edit and we try to, you know, be informed about what we publish. Uh, but essentially, it's for readers to use to learn what they need to learn. And, and our job is to keep abreast of what they need to learn and to make sure that each side feels accurately represented. Um, so in a decade of doing this, you know, we've obviously learned a fair bit about what uh, China's problems are. Um, I like to think that Chinese readers have had a kind of useful engagement and we certainly, I think, helped or at least offered the opportunity for people outside China to understand, even if they don't read Chinese, we'll translate it for them, um, to understand what's going on in China, which would certainly make for a better engagement. That's wonderful, Isabel. And many thousands read your website and your newsletters. Mercifully. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the, the ten paths to a hopeful future in my book include climate change action around renewable energy, better management of fresh water, efforts to protect and restore forests, better urbanisation, care for biodiversity, but care for the marine environment. I mean, it's a huge subject. It is quite a lot, Edward. <laughs> and uh, beyond me by a long stretch, but I'm going to give it a try. But, I, but clearly China's problems and the solutions that it's identified span all of these issues and, and more. Um, so I'm in the market on the one hand for sort of good stories where things are going well in China and periodically the lowest plateau is mentioned amongst others. Uh, but also to get a scale of the a sense of the scale of the challenge. Yeah. Um, well, it's a, both a very bad and a, and a pretty good story. You know, mm. depending on on where you stand. I think when we first started ten years ago, environmental problems brought on by industrial development were very much on the fringe. You know, the attitude in China was. Develop first, clean up later. Uh, worrying about the environment is a rich country luxury. We can't afford to. We have a lot of poverty to deal with. We have a lot of arrested development that we have to catch up on, and this is the quickest way to do it. And so the Chinese had the world's biggest, fastest, dirtiest industrial revolution. And they were doing so in a country that had relatively little headroom. You know, the margins of error in China are not like the United States. The United States had a relatively small population and a very big country. Uh, China had a very large population, five times the size of the United States, in roughly the same surface area, an awful lot of which, if you look at that map behind you, mm. you can see how little of China is actually useful. Mm. Uh, you know, an awful lot of it is mountain and desert. Mm. So the population is crammed, in, you know, largely into the uh, 
fertile, the usable parts. So if you damage the environment in China, you are you are starting from from as I say a, a, a place where there's very little room for error. So a few you know a decade or so in, it was getting pretty serious and. In 2005, 2006, you began to hear people saying, particularly certain people in the Ministry of Environmental Protection, which was then an agency rather than a ministry, but there was the vice minister there who argued very strongly that China couldn't follow that path. It couldn't go on making the mistakes that the West had made on the assumption that it would clean up afterwards because long before then it would be, it would be in a crisis and indeed that is what has happened. So China has simultaneously a crisis of water supply, a crisis of water contamination, a crisis of emissions, of climate change emissions, uh, a crisis of soil pollution and a crisis of air pollution, which is what we hear most about because mm. people are very exercised about it. At the same time, in terms of you're looking at marine issues, China's polluted and uh, it's and overfished its coastal waters very seriously and has since developed the world's largest deep sea fishing fleet and he is busy sailing the seas and hoovering up the fish so it's having an impact everywhere so that's the bad news and certainly if you look at something like water something absolutely fundamental like water uh, north of the Yangtze, which is roughly half half the country, the northern half of the country, which includes the capital, and it includes Hebei province, which surrounds the capital and is responsible for a great deal of China's GDP. It's simply running out of water. And, and uh, you know, uh, it, that is a problem that is not going to go away and is going to have to be dealt with. On the upside, why is this also a good news story? Um, China did eventually understand that it's a prosperity which was very welcome obviously to a lot of people who've been lifted out of poverty would not continue unless the environmental crisis was addressed and at the same time that heavy industrialization phase of its uh, economic uh, growth had pretty much played out you know they they built pretty much all the infrastructure that were going to be built and they were having a surplus of steel and cement and all that expertise. The cheap t-shirt mass manufacture, they were pretty much pricing themselves out of that because wage levels had, had risen as a result of success, but also because the demographic means that China has an aging population, so they didn't have all that you know, very low priced manual labor coming off the countryside 30 years into the Industrial Revolution. And so China, like almost every other tiger in, in Asia that gone through this cycle, understood that it had to move up the value chain, it had to move up the technology chain, it had to go for a leaner, more effective, more efficient uh, production. And it had to look at what technologies China could develop and own uh, in order to sustain economic growth going forward, albeit at a lower level. And as they looked at this conundrum, and it's a very, very tricky problem for China, they understood that uh, sooner or later there was going to be a carbon-constrained world and that China ought to get into low-carbon technologies in a very big way, which they did. They're now the biggest producers of solar and wind. They have the biggest installed capacity of both. Um, they're building a lot of nuclear, which you might feel ambivalent about, but nevertheless, in, in climate change, they argue that's a better option. But also they've brought down the price of these technologies to the point where they become cost competitive with uh, coal, particularly in third countries. So there is no particular reason now, except for rather backward thinking, why India should be building quite as many coal-fired power stations because they could use Chinese technology to fund you know, a massive solar enterprise in India. So, you know, that's a very good news story, and Chinese emissions will certainly peak earlier, I think, than 2030, which is when they said they will. And China is committed to a carbon-constrained world, not simply in terms of mitigating its own emissions, because it's betting the farm on the success of, of climate change action. So that's one good story. On water... Um, in, I think, and you have to check this, but uh, in 
the 2000s, and I think it was 2005, 2006, the Yellow River failed to reach the sea. This was a massive shock. The Yellow, you know, there are two enormous rivers which are very important to Chinese identity as well as Chinese water supply, um, the Yangtze and the Yellow River. The Yangtze is about halfway up the country and the Yellow River is in the north. Both of them derive from the mountains in the west, from the Qinghai uh, Himalaya Plateau. The Yellow River is where Chinese civilization began in the Great Bend of the Yellow River. It goes back a long way. And suddenly the mother river of China just wasn't there anymore. It didn't mm. reach the sea. Mm. This was quite a profound shock. Um, it was a cultural and psychological shock as well as, you know, frankly, a practical shock because, you know, people have been drawing water from the Yellow River for thousands of years. Mm. And that's, uh, you, can't, you can't really run anything without water. You can't live without water. So... As the Chinese set up a commission to restore the Yellow River, and there were multiple causes of the problem: over extraction, degradation of the headwaters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, after several years of effort, the, quite a lot of of restoration has taken place on the Yellow River, and that has included using kind of innovative policy tools uh, like um, ecos you know, ecosystem values. So mm -hmm. if you're a lower riparian, you live low down the river mm -hmm. and you find your water supply isn't there anymore, you can pay the people at the headwaters to stop chopping down those trees. Right, right. So it, it's a way of balancing out the ecological cost and benefit. So if you're a poor person on the plateau, why shouldn't you chop down a tree? You know, that's how they thought. But actually why you shouldn't is because it affects the whole river's ecosystem. But the people who are benefiting from the river further down, who are on the whole better off, you know, needed a way of transferring some of the of the, of mm. the uh, benefits up to the people mm. on, at the top. So all of that sort of mm. started to be discussed. Mm. And I think that the importance of that moment was that until then, and, and probably still quite a lot, actually, probably a bit more than I'm comfortable with, the Chinese have taken an engineering approach to their water problem. Mm. So, and the Chinese are terrific engineers. Um, but it also kind of fitted in with the man conquers nature ethos of the Mao era. So in, in Mao's day, China built more dams than any, anywhere else on earth, and more of them collapsed than anywhere mm. else on earth. And particularly if you get to politically sensitive moments or difficult moments like the Great Leap Forward, which was a complete mm. disaster. It was a disaster accompanied by a lot of shouting of that nature. So we must go out and conquer nature. We will, you know, transform China. We will divert rivers hither and yon. We will, you know, do all that. They even tried, in, as you look back now, this is complete insanity. Um, they tried to melt one of the biggest glaciers in North China, mm. um, Tianshan Number no. 1, uh, in order to irrigate the Hexi Corridor, so, which is an arid area. So there are all these accounts of people, you know, villagers, mass movements, heading up with flags and trumpets blazing to lay coal dust on a glacier in order to melt it. You know, uh, you know mm. as we look back now, mm. we think, mm. how could they have? Could but they that have? is very much the yeah. way they thought. Yeah. You know, that it was all about the will of man and the capacity of man, and nature could jolly well fall into line. <laughs> well, of course, nature has a way of biting back. Mm. And uh, the Chinese uh, approach to uh, water supply and the, and the water shortages in North China which are still, you know, largely engineering-led. So the South North Water Diversion Project, which is a, a three-pronged uh, effort to bring water from the relatively water-rich South up to the North, was regarded as the, you know, saving project. Hugely expensive and actually ineffective. So when the Yellow River did dry up, it did allow space for other systems, other thinking about ecosystems to enter the national discussion. And the health of a, a riverine ecosystem began to kind of gain ground as an important thought, mm. hence protecting the headwaters, hence mm. you know, watching for over-extraction, and not simply relying on building a massive Great Canal and bringing expensive dirty water from the south to the north, where it was never going to be enough. And in one of the ways that nature bit back the source for the South North Water Project, the, um, the the most advanced bit of it, which is the eastern wing, began to suffer from a drought. Mm. And so mm. there wasn't enough water to do that anyway.
So that's sort of a good news. It, that mm. that a more rounded approach is is, is yeah. now is now gaining ground, and I think that there will be multiple approaches to um, because the crisis is so severe in North China um, that they are going to be forced to take a more holistic approach to their own water supply. It's probably going to be worse with climate change. We don't really know what impact uh, climate change is going to have on the Asian monsoons, but it's it's going to vary. And that means that you know, you're, you've got another factor of unpredictability in your water supply. So we'll see. And in the long term, of course, those glaciers, there, you know, there's a lot of ice on the on that plateau, and it will take a long time to melt. But in the end, you know, that's another serious worry for China's long-term sustainability. If the source of those rivers becomes seriously degraded, then you know, that's a really, really big problem. Not just for China, but actually for the whole of the the watershed of the plateau, which includes uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Uh, um, Myanmar, the Mekong also, so it's pretty serious stuff. Thank you as well. The, Sorry, that was a bit of a blast. No, no, that was wonderful. <laughs> and the, um, the, the <clears throat> Chinese people are more exercised now than ever before by the extent of environmental degradation, pollution, etc. And there's a concept of the ecological civilization which has entered into the national planning process. Indeed. Um, again, I think that, you know, when, when we first started, I always find that 10-year... You look back ten years. I mean, it's quite extraordinary how things have changed. Because when, when I would first raise the question of climate change, for instance, with my own journalists in Beijing, mm. who are amongst the most clued-up people in China, they would say, you know, Chinese people don't care about climate change. They care about pollution. Mm. And uh, it's it's quite interesting now, a decade on, that those two have come together. Because and they were right. Chinese people care about pollution, because pollution is a something that they have to live with every day and they have understood. For a while, I think people felt, you know, I don't know if you remember that old English, uh, well, not that old, but people used to talk about Yorkshire in a positive way, saying where there's muck, there's brass, you know, where, <laughs> where there's dirt, there's money. And that was, again, very much alive and well in China as an idea. Uh, Mao was terribly proud of factory chimneys. It was a sign of modernity. He loved them in the middle of the city because, you know, it, it meant development. Mm. Whoopee, there's my factory chimney and lots of black smoke coming out of it. Mm. Now, you know, fast forward to the, to the mid-2000s, that black smoke is killing people in very, very large numbers. And um, the smog in Beijing, which when I first was a student in Beijing in the 70s, you know, the the only thing you suffered from really was sandstorms in the winter from, mm. you know, time to time. Other than that, Beijing was celebrated for the clarity of its blue skies. It's in all the literature. Mm. And now, I mean, if you see a blue sky, you know, you call, you call, you call your family, you, you take photographs, you put it on the internet. Yeah, the smog mm. is awful. Mm. And people have become less and less tolerant of the smog. Yes. They've also become less and less tolerant of um, the sighting of factories, they've become extremely suspicious yeah. of things like the chemical industry. Um, they've become extremely suspicious about the, the, the safety of their food and the adulteration of their food. Mm. So there's been a tremendous kind of surge in environmental awareness mm. in China, which again is quite new, mm. actually. Mm. You know, people talk about Chinese people being close to nature. Not in my experience. Mm. Uh, even if you look mm. at the progress of Chinese civilization and what it's done to nature. It hasn't been a happy story on the no, whole. No. But now, certainly in terms of uh, concerns about health, concerns about the health of their child, yeah, mm. because most people still have one child, um, and just the quality of life. You know, China's urban middle classes have got to the point where they are really not prepared to put up with it anymore. And this is creating political pressure mm -hmm. on the party. Mm -hmm. And it has, you've seen this move up Mm. The, the concerns until it emerges as ecological civilization, which mm. is a high level. It's the slogan of the Xi Jinping era. Mm. And when something gets to that level, mm. it starts to come down through all the policy papers, through all the sort of economic planning, mm. all the 13 to five year plan, you have at least a nod to mm. ecological civilization. And so that's also very important. It's uh, a completely different mindset from develop first, clean up later. This mm. is putting mm. 
the care of the environment at the heart of an economic strategy. Mm. Now, uh, it's a very big tanker to turn around, mm. Mm. but it's a very important development and one that we should salute. And I mm. think one that people are really not aware of because people outside China tend to think of China as, you know, polluting and not caring. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, you know, there is very, very high level concern and very big popular concern. A lot of it has come, as I say, from pressure from people and that has also implied a growth of civil society and a growth of informed civil society mm -hmm. on environmental issues. This is always tricky in a one-party state. What are the boundaries and the limits of, of autonomous action? How far can you criticise? How far can you take action? All of this is constantly in flux. But nevertheless, there is a core of activity which is highly informed, highly intelligent, contributing to policy that, is, that has grown out of civil society action. And driven from within rather than as a result of external, international, holier-than-thou pressure. It, it's come from within. Mm. I, I, one has to acknowledge that it's been supported from mm, outside. Indeed, yeah. And that's partly, you know, because where does the money come from? You mm. know, the state isn't going to supply it in China. Um, the state has a slightly ambivalent view of action which is not controlled by the party. And so external financial support has been very important. That's going to get much more difficult now. Mm. There's a new law which is going to make that much trickier, I think. Um, but by now, you know, there's a... I don't think that means that ecological concerns are going to diminish simply because they are, you know, for every individual who lives in China and who breathes and, that's, and who needs water, that's pretty much everybody, mm. it's a concern. And the party knows it's a concern. Is there a concern too about forests? Is there an appreciation for forests and soil in the Chinese sort of people and culture? And I'm thinking part of the lowest plateau in this restoration story that I haven't seen, but many cite as a remarkable thing. Yes, um, the lowest plateau, as it were, has always been with us. Mm. <laughs> and uh, the lowest, I mentioned sandstorms in Beijing, mm. in mm. particularly in the winter when the when the wind is coming from the north. And that, again, is you know has been part of Beijing life, sort of forever. Beijing essentially lives on the edge of a desert, mm. and so the wind brings the sand. Uh, but, as you rightly observe, uh, that used to be rather more constrained because there just used to be a lot more vegetative cover, and particularly in Manchuria. In Manchuria, in the Qing dynasty, Han were not allowed to settle, and it was hugely forested. And, you know, within a decade of the fall of the Qing dynasty, when the Manchu could no longer keep Han or indeed Japanese out of Manchuria, the forest cover simply collapsed. It was devastated. Now, the result of that is that Beijing suffers much more from sandstorms. In, and so, you know, these things all have consequences. Mm -hmm. So again, a decade or so back, there was a big policy uh, for afforestation, and mm. that's been an awful lot of trees have been planted. Um, an awful lot of them have subsequently died because, you know, the photographs are taken when they're planted, mm. and mm. there isn't always an awful lot of follow-up. Mm. But, you know, there are serious restoration projects. You mentioned the Lurst Plateau, which is a more complicated and more planned restoration programme. Um, of which I also have heard great things, um, and certainly where I have seen the uh, application of the technique, uh, it seems to work. How widespread it is, I'm not mm. sure, because mm. there's still quite a lot of loss out there, mm. uh, which mm. I have seen. But certainly, you know, again, with with effort and official backing, well, there are things you can do, mm. and uh, afforestation has been a very, very big part mm. of the Chinese effort. Thank you. Another success story, I think, is a changing attitude around shark fin soup, but I know that that's not yet been categorically won, in a sense, as a campaign. But nevertheless, the public seem more aware now of the fact that shark fin soup, shark fin soup is you know, uh, a tragedy for the sharks, even if it's a sign of prosperity, etc., weddings and the like. I think things like um, shark's fin, ivory, rhino ivory, horn, did, yeah. pangolin... Mm -hmm. These are still pretty problematic in mm. China. Shark's fin, 
the campaign about shark fin started in Hong Kong with mm. um, with some Hong Kong you know, big NGOs, and it was backed by a number of celebrities in in China, and it did result in the banning of shark fin from official banquets. Mm. Um, one of the difficulties with declaring complete victory is that you know shark finning continues at an alarming rate. Mm. So those yeah. shark fin are going somewhere. Yeah. I was in a hotel in Hangzhou about three years ago, and I noticed this was a hotel run by a foreign uh, owner, and I noticed that they had a special shark's fin banquet option on the menu. And when I complained about it, they gave a very Chinese answer. <laughs> he said, it's all right, it's all fake. <laughs> and really? I thought, I'm not sure that is all right, but I'm very glad. Uh, but but then why? <laughs> anyway, so you you can't sort of get away apparently from the cultural value of promoting shark spin. The most you can do is to is to cheat. I'm not sure that's really it. No, you know, we not. need to change consumer attitudes. Yeah. The same is true. I mean, the the, the devastation of elephants mm -hmm. and uh, rhinos. To supply a Chinese market mm. is catastrophic. Really is, yeah. And I greatly welcome, if you're looking for good news, I greatly mm. welcome the Chinese, uh, rather belatedly, but, mm. but hooray, uh, imposing a ban mm. on ivory. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I hope that ban is enforced mm. because it is quite clear that the, the organized crime element um, of, of, you know, poaching by violence um, in, in Africa, is to feed a market in Vietnam and China. Now, I don't think the Vietnamese market is that big, so that's a gateway into mm. China, in effect. Mm. Mm. And unless we see serious enforcement by the Chinese, um, you know, it won't, it won't work. But, but in the short term, I absolutely welcome the ban, and I hope that mm. this is uh, the beginning of a, of a serious change. Again... I think we need to make ivory and rhino horn unacceptable. Mm. They need to be socially, we need to change consumer mm. attitudes. Mm. We've been running a series on elephants um, this year with The Guardian, who've been running a campaign on it. And I have to say that, you know, we, we look at the the figures for how many hits, who, who republishes us and all mm. that kind of thing. Mm. This has been very, it's got a lot of attention in China. Right. And one of China's biggest portals republished the entire series mm. to date okay. in December. So it is having an impact and I think that consumer education, you know, if you can stop people smoking, if you can mm. make it socially unacceptable to smoke, and that's a, mm. an addiction, you can make it unacceptable to give ivory, to own ivory and, you know, to to venerate ivory as a, as a sign of prosperity. It should be a sign of social disgrace and I think we can get there. Mm if we educate people and the, on the encouraging side, I think that the consciousness um, of animal welfare mm. in China has gone up mm. by leaps and bounds. Again, yeah. when I first went to China, nobody had pets. And right. the only question you asked about animals was how do you cook them? Yes. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, uh, that was pretty much it. But now you see uh, lots of people, particularly have dogs. Um, there is a growing revulsion about eating dog, um, there's certainly, and the kind of puppy farming that goes with it. You, you see, you know, Chinese campaigns which have come out yes. of people's growing understanding that, you know, you can't just treat animals, yeah, and it's ethically violent. wrong to treat yes, animals yes, that yes, way. Exactly, yeah. So that's encouraging, that's and I think if people understand yeah. what uh, the, the, the realities of the poaching and what it's doing, I, I think people will begin to feel a revulsion against mm. ivory. Right now, it, it hasn't yet had much effect. And on the animal welfare issues, the bile issue as well, which is another campaign that, that everybody... There's a, there's a big yeah. cultural problem, problem mm. I think, with uh, Chinese traditional medicine, and mm. that, you know, mm. things that are supposed to have medicinal qualities. Mm. Rhino horn is like a fingernail. It has mm. no exactly. medicinal qualities. Yeah. Bear bile, um, you know, for which there are bear farms. Uh, again, it has no particular qualities that can't be reproduced in other ways. Mm -hmm. You know, can't be generated in non-animal form. The pangolin, the tiger, all of these things are—they're kind of, you know, 
they're pretty medieval in their mm. sort of sets of, of, of in their in their scientific basis sure. and could be substituted if if but but there is an attachment to Chinese traditional medicine so it's culturally a little you know a little mm. tentative but I, I I do hope that TCM practitioners will will get with the program too mm. and begin to yes. be more open-minded about, yes, and yes, about this kind of thing Thank you, Isabel. This is also fascinating. I, a few more questions, if I may, conscious of the time. But one is about China's impact on the world in terms of um, its, its support for infrastructure development in Africa and increasingly in South America and elsewhere. Could that be done in a more environmentally thoughtful way? I also wanted to ask you a question about the Chinese diet and on the understanding of the sort of increasing consumption of pork, knowing that a lot of the soya of the world, and in the Amazon in particular, is being channeled towards um, the, the, the Chinese diet and also you know, the Western diet. Uh, but th those two questions, if, if, <laughs> if you would. And then I wanted to finally ask about Tibet, because that's how you and I met oh, gosh. the environmental situation in Tibet, if that's, oh, my. If that's all right. Um, <laughs> right, where, where do we start? Uh, mm -hmm. Infrastructure. One of, the, one of the effects of China reaching the point of development that it has is that they're pretty much infrastructured up in China and they have mm. a lot of surplus capacity. Now, it's always socially difficult to close down surplus capacity. So there are two drivers of Chinese infrastructure building. You have very, very big companies with a lot of expertise looking for new markets. And they are not, on the whole, companies with a tremendously impressive track record of either you know, citizen engagement or environmental uh, responsibility. They're going out into the world backed by um, state-supported loans. They are themselves state-subsidized, um, as SOEs tend to be. And so they outcompete any more responsible uh, company, and they're very aggressive. Now, on the upside, it's absolutely true that Africa needs infrastructure, and indeed parts of Latin America uh, or Central Asia. On the downside, if that infrastructure is not built responsibly, then it can leave a terrible legacy uh, environmentally. It's particularly true I mean, in, in Latin America. If you look at some of the proposals to build uh, you know, roads and railways through the Amazon, uh, you have to worry. Mm -hmm. Now, as Chinese companies do this, they're meeting with an external environment which doesn't entirely behave the way a Chinese environment does. Mm -hmm. So you are certainly seeing resistance uh, mm. in Latin America to, and, and a demand for accountability. Mm. On the good news side, the Chinese investment vehicles um, we say that they are going to operate to the highest standards of accountability and environmental responsibility. It's slightly yet to be demonstrated because it's not clear what those lines of accountability are. So if you are in Ecuador and there is a, a proposal for what you consider a very damaging infrastructure project uh, and there isn't really an environmental impact assessment that you can access or that is worth anything, with, who do you complain to? It's not clear. There are no clear lines of, of communication as yet. But having made the claim, then Chinese institutions, you know, can be held accountable for their failure uh, to, to honour it. So there are ways to try to make this better, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably as good as it gets yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. What was the same? Di oh, the diet issue. The oh, diet oh. issue. <laughs> we have seen, as Chinese get more affluent, mm. uh, they want to eat that, more yeah. meat. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that you see with that is the uh, acquisition of a whole set of health problems that we are mm. familiar with here. So diabetes, uh, obesity um, have begun to be problems in China in ways that they weren't before. Um, but another, uh, probably more worrying problem, I mean, there are two things. One is the deforestation of the Amazon to produce soya, to produce, mm. uh, to produce meat. But intensive farming in China is an extremely, it is, is really a catastrophe waiting to happen. Mm. Uh, overuse of antibiotics. Mm. In fact, we, I think the last week or so, mm. we have been seeing reports of antibiotic resistance mm. to one of the last strains that still work, uh, 
Mm. We, and it's come out of farming practices in China. Mm. So we are, you know, you are putting an awful lot at risk mm. to produce cheap meat in China. Mm. And the state of Chinese veterinary services is not such that you can be entirely confident that, you know, this will get by without a without a catastrophe at some point or another. You know, China has traditionally been the source of new influenza um, mm. viruses and kind of plagues because certainly around Canton in particular you had a, 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 a particular conjunction of human beings, pigs and poultry living in very close proximity and for some reason this generates mm. new pathogens which then spread. Mm. I think we're going to see a slightly industrial scale version of that, so that's something to worry right. about. Yeah. Uh, you also see, again, on, on the upside, you also see an increased consciousness of food safety, but also food and health. Mm. And there are there is a, an organic movement in mm. China now. Um, there is quite a lot of... Um, exchange of information and social media uh, in praise of vegetarianism. There are vegetarian traditions in China. Mm. And I think that um, without you know wishing to dictate that everybody be a, a, a vegetarian, I think people are beginning to understand that an overconsumption of meat is, is a very, very mixed blessing, both environmentally and on personal terms. Mm. Thank you, Isabel. That's incredibly clear. You and I first met when I read your wonderful book about the Panchen Lama and I was chair of the Tibet campaign at the university. I remember so it well. And um, I know that Tibet faces its own environmental challenges and uh, China has uh, often thought of Tibet as a sort of dumping ground for waste and things. But is there anything happening in Tibet at the moment of particular concern or, or country or particularly things turning in the right direction? I, I think... A number of things mm. are happening in Tibet, mm. and none of them, I'm afraid, particularly reassuring. Mm. One is, at a global level, uh, Tibet is a climate change hotspot, and mm. temperatures are rising faster mm. there than yeah. in the global average, much faster. And that means that the whole ecology is changing. Um, it's actually a problem for building infrastructure, because you know the Chinese built a railway across the Qinghai-Tibet plateau, which they now have to freeze artificially uh, to keep it stable, so it, it's, <laughs> it's a problem. The other thing that's happening though, uh, you know, as China, that border uh, between China and Central Asia used to be a closed border. I mean, in, in the post-war period it was a closed border. Uh, clearly before that, you know, there were trade routes across it. One Belt, One Road, which is the great Chinese, you know, global infrastructure project mm. it goes right through western China so Xinjiang and, and Tibet and, and beyond um, and these are communications corridors, they're energy corridors and so on, so what you have seen, and the beginnings of this I suppose were the western development program which is now more than a decade old and and the railway and the migration of Han Chinese into uh, relatively fragile and underpopulated Western regions, including Tibet. There is a reason why regions like Tibet are underpopulated. They're underpopulated because the carrying capacity of the ecology is relatively low. You get too many people there, and the damage is quicker and, and harder to remedy. So you have a weight of population. You have a disruption of traditional uh, patterns of living, so uh, nomadic pasture, uh, uh, pastoralists have been pretty much settled. And so the management of the, of the high pastures has broken down. You've had plagues of, you know, rodents and, mm. and things which resulted from the killing of predators after the Chinese occupation of Tibet. So there's a whole kind of accumulation mm. of things, added to which there has been um, an upsurge in the building of dams mm. for hydropower and in mining. Mm. And you, you see a sort of industrialization of regions which were never prepared for it and probably can't sustain it. And this is partly a result of government policy, 
which claims to be raising living standards, but it's also a result of people in the more affluent parts of China, in eastern China, being fed up with dirty industries. So there's a sort of arbitrage. They're going west, where provinces are poorer, where provincial governors are less rigorous. None of this is particularly good. No, indeed, indeed. And, and the Tibetans yeah. are not benefiting, really, no, because sure. most of these jobs go to... Han Chinese, mm. and uh, so the Tibetans who have an entirely different approach to landscape mm. and lakes mm. and all this and nature are being marginalized really. And, and they're being marginalized by a model which is already pretty discredited in central China. Yes, indeed. It's tragic. Poor, poor Tibet. Poor Tibet. The um, spectre of Chinese leadership on the environment internationally is higher now because of the potential resigning of US leadership from the Paris and, you know, God forbid, but there's an interesting paradox in a sense, all of these problems domestically, and yet also lots of very good things happening, as you've described, but now a real potential international leadership role for China, which it's already occupied, but could occupy more in, in the years ahead. Indeed, I mean, we've seen a radical shift in Chinese climate diplomacy between Copenhagen and mm. Paris. And mm. and that was that period, I, I, I think I referred to, in which the leadership understood that their technological future depended, or mm. could depend, on a low carbon, uh, a carbon constrained world. Key to that was a deal, really, between the Obama administration and the Chinese, and a very, very extensive collaboration on climate change. There is no issue of climate denial mm. in China. They're all, you know, technically <laughs> literate. They get it. Um, but you do have, you don't have that kind of confusion that, that the fossil fuel industry has managed to create in, in the United States around whether it's real or not. That's not an issue in China. But what is an issue is, you know, very large vested interests which have to somehow be turned around. Um, and the sheer, you know, challenge of turning around a model which has been a high carbon model into a, a more sustainable one. Nevertheless, as I said, China is betting the farm on this, and they are sufficiently confident, I think, at this point that even if the United States were under Trump to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, that China would see that. Um, I think 10 years ago they would have said, well, if, if the United States isn't doing anything, why should we? But now they see it as, well, if the United States is not going to exert leadership, this is a tremendous opportunity for China. And it's an opportunity, I don't know if you followed Xi Jinping's speech in Davos, mm. where you had a rather startled global elite reeling <laughs> under the shock of, of, yes, Trump really was president, and no, there wasn't a responsible Trump hiding behind the mask. Um, Xi Jinping turns up in a suit and a tie and gives this wonderful, calm, reassuring commitment to uh, to Paris and many other things. And uh, you absolutely see that this is an opportunity. Now, my concern would be um, that, that, as you know, uh, the Paris Agreement uh, and all the commitments under the Paris Agreement don't get us to where we need to be. Mm. And it's a fantastic achievement, it's a great framework, but it but it really depended on the willingness of all parties to come back and put more on the table quite soon, to ratchet up the commitments uh, if we are to stay below uh, two degrees of warming. I guess my concern would be how willing China is going to be to t exert that kind of leadership. If you look at the pattern of Chinese commitment, it's very much committed to the process now. It's uh, INDC, it's its commitments, its promises under Paris are pretty safe. You know, there is no, what, what China doesn't like to do is to make promises that it then doesn't fulfill. That's embarrassing. So it under promises and over delivers. Now, at some point, we need those promises to get much more, you know, serious. Yeah. And were China to do that, it would have a tremendous effect, I think, on everybody else. How can you lag behind China, you know, if China is prepared to put mm. bigger cuts, bigger commitments on the table? It does exert pressure. Clearly, if China and the United States were to do it together, mm. it would be better. Mm. But 
we may be in a bit of a... We are where we are. We are where we are, <laughs> wherever that is. <laughs> um, so so it, it, it is pretty much up to China. But, you know, it's. I think that if you look at the map of emissions these days and look at where the trouble's coming from, mm. clearly China's a problem, but I think we know where China sits mm. in terms of ambition. India, I'm much less confident mm. about, uh, and India has a tremendous potential mm. to do a lot of damage mm. before it reaches the point that China has reached of mm. understanding that this is really a very, why would you build stranded assets at this mm. point? You know, this is not a good policy. I don't think we're there with India. No. And again, the distraction of the United States is very unwelcome in that mm. respect, mm. because India is still at a point where kind of will make an excuse of other people dropping yes, out. Yes, China is past that point. Yes, very clear. And we one could hope that India and China could collaborate in a sort of positive way, but it's not... One clear. might hope. One might hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you hopeful about China in light of all that you know and all that you read and write and learn about the country? Um, I, <laughs> gosh. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's never an entirely unqualified answer no, on China. Probably, yeah. It's 1.4 billion people and mm. it's a very complicated place. There are concerns about China. Um, there are concerns about its political evolution. There are concerns about its economic and social stability. You mm. know, there's a big debt problem. Mm. There's a big... It is not entirely easy to steer China through the middle income trap. Most countries don't get out of the middle income trap. Mm and a prolonged period of stagnation in China, you know, could have complicated political results. I've seen China change so much in the last 20, 30 years. I still think there's a lot of digesting of that change to go on. You've seen enormous social rupture, you know, family structures, ways of living, culture, all of that is still playing out. It still has to settle down. China has the potential, really, to be a stabilizing factor right now. China has tremendous talents in terms of supply chain and production, which turned to low-carbon technologies are, frankly, a global benefit. And we must hope. Isabel, thank you very, very much. Thank you.